So it's okay if you want to do JPEG. Yeah? Um, so let me just very quickly uh, remind you, we consider the following basis uh, uh, phi n equals 1, actually uh, let's call it phi k equals 1 over square root 10, and then omega n to the power k times 0, omega n to the power k times 1, and so forth, omega n to the power k times n minus 1. Right? So, and we explained last time uh, what is the significance of these phases that it allows uh, uh, spectral decomposition of a signal, right? So what is then the Fourier transform of a sequence uh, um, x or of a vector uh, x, uh, uh, let's call it x0 up to x n minus 1. Uh, well, this is simply uh, the discrete Fourier transform of x is simply the sequence of coordinates of this vector in this particular basis. Right? So then x will be the perennial formula, right? A i equals uh, from the zero to n minus 1 and then scale the product of x with the uh, phi i times phi i and this guy we call usually uh, the sequence uh, so the sequence so x hat is just a sequence of coordinates uh, so it's uh, x dot phi 0, uh, x dot phi 1, up to x dot phi n minus 1. So if you write this explicitly, what this means, uh, you get that um, x k coordinate right in the new basis is just uh, uh, x times pk by k which is sum when i goes from 0 to n minus 1 um, x times and because the space is complex we have to conjugate the second entry Right, so it will be omega n uh, k i with, oops, with a minus in front of it, or let me put it uh, omega uh, k times i conjugate, which is of course equal sum i equals from 0 to n minus 1. Uh, and here is x i, so x i times uh, omega n to the minus k i. Now, um, uh, sorry, I'm missing the square root of n in front of here. Okay, um, so what, uh, uh, so how can we see this? Uh, well, if we form a uh, polynomial, uh, if we form a polynomial P, P sub x uh, uh, sorry, um, yeah, I guess you can uh, put, no, the problem is 
I'm using x size for the vector, so let's call it polynomial v of y, which is equal to 1 over square root n um, xi times y to the power of an missing sigma.
fast of the, it's my favorite engineering example, and uh, for some really strange reason, in signal processing books, uh, you uh, never find explanation why we do um, what we do. see what happens. So I told you last time when you saw all these uh, uh, calculations uh, that uh, uh, discrete Fourier transform provides uh, spectral analysis of a signal. So let's see. Uh, here is a simple signal that is just sum of two cosine waves. Uh, right? And let's take 64 samples. Uh, right? So we take 64 samples of the signal and uh, let's plot it and see what it looks like. Uh, here it is. Uh, right, so this is just taking 64 samples of this uh, uh, signal. Okay, so now we want to compute the Fourier transform uh, from what's behind the screen. Uh, uh, you know, here is the matrix that we just wrote, right? It's the matrix of the powers of the uh, roots of unity that is used to evaluate uh, the corresponding polynomial uh, in the powers of the roots of unity. Okay, so now if we multiply, of course, we don't do, do we actually do multiplication of this matrix uh, of roots of unity with, uh, with, single, with uh, signal samples. In practice, when the speed is important, instead of this matrix factor multiplication, what do we do? How do you compute the speed Fourier transform efficiently? Fast Fourier transform, right? But uh, here the matrix is really small and we will not bother, we will just uh, um, uh, compute it directly. Okay, now uh, let's see what the discrete Fourier transform looks like. So I took the absolute values because, uh, remember, the discrete Fourier transform is uh, a um, complex value sequence, so we plot it, we take the, its modules, and not surprisingly, it has four peaks. Why four peaks? Well, you see, it has four peaks uh, because um, here we have cosine plus cosine, right? Uh, so somehow we have to cancel out the imaginary parts. And to cancel out the imaginary parts, we simply, uh, that's the reason, because the values on the right are complex conjugates of the values from the left. So when you sum them up, uh, you get precisely uh, the real signal. So that's why we have four peaks. And you can see the peak is on the fourth pin and the eighth pin, and that precisely corresponds, right, because the, we have DC component zero pin, right, so this precisely corresponds to the multiple three here, 
and multiple seven, right? Okay, very nice, nothing surprising there. But let's now change things a little bit. Uh, and let's take the signal that is not a integer multiple, so that the um, angle is not integer multiple of the beam size. Uh, right? Because here we have fraction 3.5 and here 7.5. Uh, and let's again take 64 samples. Right? And let's look at the Fourier transform. Oops, no, this is in time domain. Uh, then we compute its Fourier transform by multiplying it with the matrix that we have on the whiteboard. And what happens doesn't look like anything logical. You see, first, you can understand why there are actually multiple peaks here. Because the true frequency is in between. So somehow you need several frequencies, right? At least two frequencies to combine to slightly change the frequency of the sound, right? But what is all this stuff? Look, it, look, it appears that there are also significant high frequencies. So it looks like it, this is not going to be very useful. But uh, let's see where the frequencies come from. So let's take the inverse uh, Fourier transform, right? And let's, be, and of course, the discrete Fourier transform is periodic. And what we are going to do, we are going to evaluate the inverse Fourier transform not at n inputs, but to n inputs. So, okay, and then we are going to plot uh, first period, second period, and the uh, two point uh, in between uh, that joins in between. And lo and behold, this is what you get. Uh, this is the first period, and then here it's the second period just repeated. And the black line joins the last point of the first period with the first point of the second period. This is for uh, when the beams, when the frequencies smack on the beam. Let's do the same for the signal when the frequency is halfway, right? When it's between the beams. Now you have to tell me. What is the fundamental difference between these two plots that explains all this mess that happens in the... Good Lord, but you know what? This is actually red on my computer on the left <laughs> and here. It appears black. <laughs> Very interesting. That's good. Oh, well. So now it's, you see, uh, okay, let me do, uh, this is hard to see, uh, maybe I can do uh, blue, and then I can do black, uh, dash, but, so. Uh, much better. So what do you think, what is the difference between uh, these two plots? So the joining is the dashed line. So the dashed line joins the last point from the first period with the first point of the second period. What do you think, what is the fundamental difference between these two? If you look on the first plot, the joining looks pretty consistent with the samples of the signal, right? But what happens in the second one? In the second one, the signal has to, because the left end, the first point of the discrete Fourier transform, 
and last point of the discrete Fourier transform are far apart, right? They are far apart, so your signal has to jump extremely quickly for a very large difference uh, in heights, right? This is what causes this junk that appears in the discrete Fourier transform because what frequencies are capable of rapid change? Is a slow, a low frequency signal, does it change rapidly? No. So high frequencies are needed not because they are inherently present in the signal. They are needed only because of the artifact of the model. Because the model has to make a quick jump that obviously, you see, as I mentioned here, this is kind of consistent with the signal. But here, right, it's not consistent. It's a sudden jump, but much faster than the distances between any two consecutive points here, right? In order to achieve this quick jump, the discrete Fourier transform introduces artifacts that are high frequencies needed to make the jump. Now, that's the reason why you don't use discrete Fourier transform for j -Bacon. Because your model introduces strong spurious components. And if you want to be able to accurately reconstruct the signal back by taking inverse Fourier transform. You cannot throw away these high frequencies. And our idea is to discard as many frequencies as possible. Now here comes, so that's the reason, and for it, I really have absolutely no idea. I haven't seen, seen a single, single processing book that actually tells you uh, why you use discrete cosine transform. They tell you because it compacts the energy. What does this mean? Nothing. <laughs> right. um, so, um, now, here it comes now, uh, ingenious engineering. So you want a model that is more accurate in the sense that it will introduce fewer artifacts. How do you avoid the fast jumps? Well, what you do is the following. You take samples of your signal, right? And many of them. And then you flip them left to right. You mirror image them along the edge, the, the rightmost element. And you can see here, right? This is precisely what I'm doing here because this is a, a uh, uh, it goes in opposite direction. It's samples m minus j, right? So it's in the opposite direction. Um, and uh, then we join these two samples, set of samples, and let's see what we get as a signal. And you can see now there are no jumps. Because we force the signal, so here there won't be any jumps, but also there won't be here. Why? Well, because this end is exactly equal to this end here. So there are no more jumps. And lo and behold, let's take the discrete Fourier transform of this uh, pattern, I mean, extended sequence. Take the speed for the address form, and we find uh, uh, so here we plotted it, and let's compare it with the previous one. Uh, well, here uh, 600 maybe. Okay. So this is what, I, of course, now you double the number of points, uh, but. The number of points, as you will see, well, that actually really matter is, of course, only half. But notice the ghost frequencies 
are gone. Right? If you wanted to encode this signal, you would have to encode this bit here in order to be able to invert. Here, all of this is gone, and you have to encode only this bit. Now, still, this is not perfect. Why it is not perfect? Well, when you concatenate, a signal with flipped version. There will be no jumps, but what can you still have? What can you have if you have a signal, right? And then you add the flipped around. What happens here? There is no jump, but there is a cusp. Yeah. And cusps, because Fourier or a series should be continuous, right? So the problem is, of course, there will be artifacts, as you can see them here. There are artifacts, but much fewer artifacts, because the penalty for a cusp is much smaller than the penalty for this Right, so now we are in good shape to do a signal compression. So there is another really, really small uh, thing, uh, namely the discrete Fourier transform of the new sequence is still complex valued. But if you slightly rotate it, by multiplying each coordinate with this factor with the corresponding root of primitive root of unity to the power k over 2, you can verify analytically, and you will see it in a much nicer way a little bit later, uh, that what you get is a real sequence. And not only that, uh, but this sequence will be essentially um, anti-symmetric, right? If you uh, ignore the last zero, you can see that the numbers are just uh, negative uh, uh, values uh, of the uh, numbers on the left. And this thus rotated sequence is what's called the discrete cosine transform of type 2. And this is why we use it in JPEG. First, it doesn't introduce too many artifacts. Secondly, if it was complex, you would have to encode both real and imaginary part. Here, everything uh, reduces just to, uh, just to real part. And the sequence doesn't have to be encoded of length 2m because it's, it is anti-symmetric. Now, this is kind of annoying uh, feature of uh, this uh, rotation. So instead, what a more elegant uh, way of doing that, and this is just to show you, uh, well, let me see. What was this? I don't remember the number. Here, what is this? Uh, ah, yes, just to show that uh, if you add left and right ends, you get zero. So it's anti-symmetric uh, once you uh, drop the last one. OK, so for this reason, it's enough to uh, encode only the first n values. Uh, a more elegant way to do it uh, is to incorporate this rotation for k over 2 into the basis itself. Lo and behold, instead of perfect powers of the roots of unity, you introduce ones that are shifted for one half, right? So now it's easy to see that this matrix, oops, what happens here? Ah, n is equal to 8. And you will see one with, why we take 8, right? Um, 
And uh, this matrix, just like the matrix for the standard discrete Fourier transform, um, its inverse is a transposed conjugate version of itself. Right? So here, uh, as you can see, we just uh, transpose this by putting j here and uh, k here and changing the sign to positive. And now you can verify that lo and behold, these two matrices are uh, inverses of each other. And now, what I told you, signal processing is 90% just the, for the picture that I drew for you, a vector projected onto the coordinate vectors, and, uh, uh, sum, uh, and you sum up the projection times the basis vectors. So in the very same way, because this is an orthonormal basis, uh, you can simply project to that basis right, and sum up the, the projections right multiplied by the appropriate basis vectors and you get in fact the, the discrete uh, cosine transform as uh, you see uh, here and there is only m uh, terms. Okay, so this is uh, if you compare with uh, one that we did by rotating, you can see that we get exactly the same values. Uh, okay, now nice feature, because the discrete Fourier transform is real, obviously the complex exponentials have to cancel out imaginary parts. Uh, and it's easy, just basic trigonometry, uh, when you um, expand, uh, what you get is uh, uh, this formula, so samples, multiplied by the cosine of these uh, angles, corresponding angles. And uh, for the inverse Fourier transform, you get um, something similar, except that you have to divide the DC component by two. This you can see if you actually uh, do the trigonometry. OK, yeah. Um, and uh, if you apply the inverse transform, lo and behold, uh, it's precisely the same as the original samples. Okay, so let us now uh, plot the, the, the transform, the discrete transform, the discrete cosine transform, and let's plot the original discrete Fourier transform. And let's look at them at the same Picture. This is a little bit too big, let me put here 700. Okay, so look, if you think about compression, you want to take only the large harmonics. Here, nothing is really small, only here you get a few small ones, but uh, as you can see, it's thick everywhere. So this would be impossible to efficiently compress. But look at this guy. This guy vanishes here, and probably just leaving a few of these uh, will not cause uh, much distortion. So let's now try to compress both of them. How do we do that? Uh, well, let's simply uh, decide that we will keep only eight largest numbers in the transforms, right? So here it is, we are sorting uh, uh, the first one, right? And uh, now we compress, how do we compress? Well, uh, if uh, the real part uh, is uh, smaller than the eight largest number, right, we drop it. Uh, the compressed version will be equal only i times imaginary part, right? And uh, similarly, uh, if the imaginary part is uh, smaller than the 8, then we will set this equal to the real part only. Okay? Let's now do the same for the discrete cosine transform. So again, we find uh, uh, 
Ah, k is 8, I guess uh, I initialized it, okay? So let's just take those coefficients that are bigger than the 8 in size. Uh, and now let's invert. Uh, so uh, this will be just inversion of the discrete Fourier transform. Here it is. With compressed coefficients, we are dropping the quote unquote small ones, so those that are smaller than the eight in size. So. And we do the same for the uh, for the cosine for the discrete cosine transform. And uh, let's plot them both. And lo and behold, this is what you get. This approximation is pretty lousy almost everywhere and it's obtained by keeping only the eight largest coefficients right you can see here it's a total mess look at this one this here is if you keep the eight largest discrete cosine coefficients right so what is the engineering model here you make model uh, uh, accurate to what you need to do. The model with discrete Fourier transform introduces lots of artifacts that you cannot draw. The model with discrete cosine transform also introduces artifacts. But artifacts introduced are only because of discontinuity of the first derivative because we have casks. And so they are much smaller, right? So this guy, that's the reason, not energy compaction and whatnot. The reason is simply you need a model that doesn't produce a large amount of spurious, uh, uh, spurious uh, uh, objects that are not inherent uh, uh, in the physical model. Okay, so that's the story of discrete Fourier transform.